First of all, welcome everyone to this new season of Psychosocial Wednesdays. This is the fourth season. And we start with a record. I will tell you in a minute what the record is. We change a little bit things. The, the team has been reshuffled. There is me, sorry about that. There is Bernard, sorry about that. But we have a new entry, which is Ludmilla Osterman, a very talented woman, a journal, journalist, who will join us for this year. Oh, onward, hi Ludmilla, thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. I would like to thank um, IAP, <coughs> in the person of the president, Mr. Berg. IAP decided to partner with us from this year, so we are really grateful that IAP can see the importance of our, on this project. Also, I want to thank Institute of Freedom in the person of Luciana Goin. And this is amazing because I'm here in Berlin. Lumila is also in Berlin. Bernard in Munich, John is in San Francisco, and Luciana and her team is in Brazil. So this is a really global event. And Luciana is the one that from this, uh, from today actually, since a month ago, started to support us with the production and the advertisement. In fact, the record is that we have 650 people registered and 165 people live, which is our super record. Luciana, thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Stefano. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I would like to say good afternoon here in Brazil and maybe good evening. Uh, I would like to thank Stefano for the partnership from the Psychosocial Wednesday, to thank John Bibi for his time and the opportunity to spread the word and to thank everyone here. Also, thank you to Ludmilla and Bernhard. I would like to say Bernard, the name is right, I don't know, sorry. And the Mr. Berg and the EAP for the support. So thank you everybody, thank you Stefan again, and we can start if you want. Good. I would like everybody to mute themselves, please, so that we don't have interferences. If this is not possible, please Luciana, could you kindly ask your team to mute everybody but me and John. Um, I would like to tell you something about this season. This season, we decided to have a theme. The theme is individuation, and the theme is inspired by this book, which I edited, that came out in spring 2022, and is titled Individuation and Liberty in a Globalized World, Psychosocial Perspective on Freedom After Freedom. I call this book Freedom After Freedom. And I'm very happy to have John with us tonight because when I shared the idea of this book and the title Freedom of the Freedom, he said, yes, of course, I love this title, let's do it. And he wrote an amazing, an amazing paper. And he's going to talk to us about this paper of his and about freedom. So he's going to talk about in defense of the freedoms of the self. For those that don't know John, John Beebe, he is, let's say, a post-Jungian. I call him, as I call his generation, the new ancestor, and he is, without any doubt, although he's very humble, I will never say it's true, he's one of the most important Jungian thinker of the past 50 years. John is a North American Jungian analyst in practice in San Francisco, USA. He received degrees from Harvard College and the University of Chicago School of Medicine. He is a past president of the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco, where he is currently on the teaching faculty. John is also a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Books he has authored include Integrity and Depth and Energies and Patterns in Psychological Type. There is a war of consciousness. In summer, my series called um, Recovered in analytical psychology, we'll publish a book of him about um, Jungian psychiatry. So I'm very, very happy to welcome John Beebe. Thank you, John, the floor is yours. <laughs> you have provided the floor under me, uh, <laughs> the platform today, St Stefano. I see a lot of, uh, friends just in the one screen that I'm looking at. And so I imagine others are here, but uh, 
just to single out a very few of you. Uh, I see Shirley and I, I see Vicki Jo, I see Lynn, uh, and I think I should be seeing others, but my eyes are not so good uh, <laughs> when I'm trying to read a screen. Just name those three of you that have been particularly closely associated with me over many, many years. Each one of you has contributed to my understanding of what freedom is. I see Peter Dunlop uh, as well and Evangeline. And so I just want to just say to everyone here, thank you that is here uh, that I can see and thank you to everyone that I can't see. So I hope uh, I have friends here. I hope I make a few more <laughs> before the that presentation is over. I have said many times that um, if Jungian psychology is going to survive in the 21st century, and I now think it is, by the way, but I said this in the 20th century, if it's going to survive, it's going to survive on the basis of friendship. And I want to say that perhaps the place that I've learned the most about freedom is in the area of friendships. The, the, the great book on friendship has yet to be written, but friendships are incredibly important to our lives. We spend an awful lot of time talking about um, marriage, uh, sexuality, love. We don't do enough about friendship. We don't do enough about the betrayals involved in friendship and also the opportunities that appear within friendship. One writer that I did talk about friendship in an exquisite way it was E.M. Forster. And I have to say that the fact that I read E.M. Forster when I did in college, at Harvard College, where I majored in English, that's true. Uh, I think my experience reading the novels of E.M. Forster and things that he said about freedom have stayed with me uh, my entire life. And his perspective is one that I invite you all to see. His masterpiece, of course, is A Passage to India, and it is about friendship, actually, and what friendship can actually do um, for the soul. Um, Jung did understand that analysis is a place where a kind of friendship can develop. Now, unfortunately, all psychotherapists uh, both are symbolic when they should be concrete and concrete when they should be symbolic. That seems to be the shadow of our field. And so there are people who literalize friendship in the wrong way or mistake it for sexual love and enact it as sexual love in the, in the analytic or the, or the post-analytic uh, situation. I, I'm not advocating that. And, I, and we know from bitter experience how, uh, a disillusioning that is, and not only for the people involved or, or even destructive, but also um, disillusioning about what the what the eros in analysis is really about. It's a, Jung gets closer when he finally, in the psychology of the transference, after he finishes with all the famous alchemical diagrams, equates friendship with kinship libido, kinship, K-I-N. S-H-I-P, a term he appropriated from anthropology and added to it Freud's word libido, which he had given already a much broader uh, meaning than simply sexual energy. Kinship libido is a very, very important thing that gets incubated in analysis. And again, depth psychology owes everything to Shakespeare as um, Harold Bloom has told us. In fact, he, uh, he thought that Shakespeare invented depth psychology uh, for dramatic purposes as a, as a writer for the stage. But uh, Shakespeare is the one who said, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. And I love that, kin meaning family or kinship or kindred. And uh, of course, we have a lot of ways of misusing kinship libido. And then if we make it just to, to apply to the members of our own tribe or sexual orientation or political point of view or gender or psychological type or cultural attitude, we've really 
done a terrible job with uh, the opportunity kinship libido gives us. I believe kinship libido can also be important to talk about in relation to freedom. And I think very often um, people go to analysis, uh, among other things, because they can't live their psychological life anywhere else. And because they're hoping to have what Joseph Henderson, I think, wisely called a symbolic friend. Uh, and and, and that often is in the form, at least temporarily and perhaps permanently uh, in, the, in the person of the analyst. But even that is not all that there is. One actually discovers that one's own psyche, the very thing that gets in one's way, the fly in everybody's ointment, the, one's own psyche actually can turn out to be one's friend rather than as we often think of it, one's enemy that needs to be treated in some way. And many people come to, to psychotherapeutic work to get their psyche treated. Uh, and with that, sometimes they think that means is they want to be talked out of their psyche or drugged out of their psyche or have their psyche somehow tamed. And the idea that the psyche can be one's actual friend and that its libido is kin. Uh, uh, when Jung was a very young man, he, his education depended a great deal on his father's library. And in that library uh, was a copy of Nietzsche's Human, All Too Human, and the second part of Human, All Too Human, uh, in the edition that was in Jung's father's library, had a long uh, dialogue uh, between the wanderer and his shadow. And uh, I'm convinced that it's from that particular book that Jung took the term shadow. He, there were other people in the 19th century who were talking about the doppelganger, uh, who were talking about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or in the E.T.A. Hoffman's uh, fairy tales. But I think it was in that book that the wanderer and uh, has a as a as a uh, uh, dialogue with his shadow, and at some point one of them says to the other, "The, the shadow compliments the wanderer on his attitude," and, and sort of, as I recall, it's the shadow who says to the wanderer, um, "Let us let us be good neighbors to the things closest to us." And uh, things closest to us, I think, um, are often kept in the shadow. Uh, and they include, for many of us, our desires, our envies, uh, our disappointments, things. And, and the idea that you could make friends with that part of yourself. Uh, the shadow compliments the wanderer, um, uh, who in these days, it seems like everyone I know is a wanderer of some kind on and the earth, the planet earth begins to feel more and more like a wanderer in space. I, I feel that idea that Jung took very early on reflects his entire attitude toward the unconscious and the, and, uh, the idea of being good neighbors uh, moves toward actually developing a kind of friendly relationship with, with the unconscious. I can't imagine that someone who has a friendly relationship with their own unconscious would be as tempted to be inimical to everyone on whom one projects that unconscious. In other words, we all live in a world of projections and assumptions, and we can't stop the fact that we are projection-making creatures. But if we want to get free of the most ruinous aspect of our projections, it starts with how we look at the unconscious itself that we're projecting onto others. Now, many of us have had to learn it the other way around, 
we don't like someone and then we discover we like them better. And then we look at our, that side of ourself that made us dislike them and start to like that side better. But I'm turning that around today when I talk about freedom. So in a way, what, I, what I'm looking for in this essay or talking about in my own way in this essay that meant so much to me to write and that I would never have written without Stefano's invitation for his book on freedom after freedom is actually based in earlier work like Integrity and Depth that I wrote and also in a paper that I wrote that he managed to rescue from uh, uh, the past. I wrote it when I was uh, uh, 41 years old and I had always felt I needed to keep working on it and 41 years later I was able to produce it in a book he edited uh, with that in the, of the double books called The New Ancestors. And that uh, book uh, that I uh, that I updated my paper, The Trickster in the Arts, in exactly that I published at the age of 41, I republished 41 years later at the age of 82. And at last, the form that for four decades I had wanted to have it in. So I, I, I encourage you to take a look at also that book. If you can afford to keep up with uh, Stefano, uh, it's, it's a good use of your annual uh, literary budget. I suspect he'll bankrupt us all yet because he brings out books very rapidly, but uh, his books are well worth reading. And I cite that uh, uh, paper because in it, I try to talk about the integration that I found so essential to my own midlife as a man with an on and off problem, to put it mildly, that started analysis with a mother problem and discovered that I had quite an on and off problem as well. And so, uh, and not being heterosexual and not having a female uh, wife or even a partner uh, that I could project that on at that particular time, I had to meet my anima on my own and begin to work with it. And so I really felt at that point that I was at the very hinge of my own individuation. It was either gonna, I was either gonna individuate or I was going to really implode. And so many people like myself in my generation particularly did implode that it was once again, a matter of life and death. And so in putting this together, I realized that the, um, as Jung had taught us a long time ago, that the shadow is essential to the anima, that you can't as a man make the anima work as a connecting point to the unconscious uh, if it's not strong enough to stand up and, and create the, the bridge. And creating the bridge is tricky. And so I had to write the paper, The Trickster in the Arts, to talk about the trickster. But what I ended up with saying that the man at midlife needs to integrate the trickster into his anima structure. So I commend that paper, uh, just as I commend my book, Integrity and Depth, in which I talk about the wander and the shadow, because they're in the background, what I mean by integrity, what I mean by the integration of the trickster into the anima to free the anima up to do her actual job of, at least in this man, connecting him. This business of anima and animus gets so complicated. Is that the animus that does that for a woman? Is the animus even a good word? Is it a, an outdated concept, et cetera, et cetera? There are many papers about this. I always say that, and of course I'm a man of gonna be 84 this year. So I, I, I'm a man not only of, my, of, of many times. And so what has seemed to me true over the years of my practice is that the connecting point to the unconscious is about three to one contrasexual figures to uh, you could say isosexual figures. That is to say, if I as a man have images of something connecting me to my unconscious, it's more likely to be a female figure than a male figure, even though my sexual orientation and life partnership is with another man. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, my anima told me that she liked that man. And so my anima is definitely a female anima 
most of the time. I think men have anonymous too. So I say it's three to one, yet I've noticed working with women that very often that connecting point is male, but not always, it can also be female. And I seem to find this true of both uh, heterosexual and homosexual people, which I think is interesting. Of course, I've been challenged on this point many, many a time, but I don't like to turn those anonymous things into theories of love. I don't think that's a good idea. I think that it's, they're much more interesting when we talk about how we connect with ourselves and what it takes to do so. So I painfully picked together the pieces of art that had always spoken to me as a way of telling the story of the integration of the shadow into the anima, the trickster into the anima for me as a way of setting myself free and realizing the autonomy of the psyche in a positive way. So for me, that seemed to open up a space of freedom. And I must say, it certainly made me free to write and publish and speak and talk. So I'm ex exercising my freedom of speech right now and enacting the topic of my, my paper that we're talking about today. But because I can be awfully introverted, you know, thinking and extroverted, intuitive, I'm actually the latter to dominantly, but when I talk, I can sound very dry and abstract and what is he talking about? Uh, and, 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 and very library-like. Uh, I'd like to try to take something out of my inner library and share it with you to kind of give us something we can all share. And I'm going to choose a poem that I quoted in my paper, The Trickster in the Arts, which I think perfectly enacts in the poem, which is a 14 line perfect sonnet in English, perhaps one of the greatest sonnets ever written by the American poet, uh, Robert Frost. And it, it's a poem that he wrote having recently lost his wife of many years to whom he'd been absolutely faithful and, and uh, kind of a, almost obsessively connected and then she died. And then quite miraculously, he, a few months later, he met another woman uh, who, who kind of gave this difficult New England poet the time of day and really saved his life, I think, psychologically. He wanted her to divorce her husband, her husband and marry him immediately. And that was not to be the case any more than uh, Frau Stein had been willing to uh, have sex with Goethe. But uh, uh, nevertheless, was a, uh, a, a, an opening up. And Frost discovered through her what a, what a free anima could look like. And I want to use this to summon it up as an image of freedom because it might make sense of the essay that I wrote if you can see that this American poet, whom I actually met once, or at least saw once at close hand, uh, actually says it, says what freedom after freedom, in other words, after the man is free again from a marriage, free again, even through the image of a beloved that he can't actually take possession of or have, but I'm talking that opens up the space of freedom that I think I'm talking about in a very different way in this essay in, in Stefano's new book. I keep saying Stefano, I mean to say Stefano. The Silken Tent by Robert Frost, and I, I hope this can be followed also in Portuguese. Remember, he's talking about someone. She is as in a field, a sink, silken tent. At midday, when a sunny summer breeze has dried the dew and all its ropes relent, so that in guise it gently sways at ease and its supporting central cedar pole that is its pinnacle to heavenward and signifies the sureness of the soul, seems to owe naught to any single chord, 
but strictly held by none is loosely bound by countless silken ties of love and thought to everything on earth, the compass round. And only by one's going slightly taut in the capriciousness of summer air is of the slightest bondage made aware. I'll repeat it. She is as in a field, a silken tent at midday when a sunny summer breeze has dried the dew and all its ropes relent, so that in guise it gently sways at ease and its supporting central cedar pole that is its pinnacle to heavenward and signifies the sureness of the soul seems to owe naught to any single cord, but strictly held by none is loosely bound by countless silken ties of love and thought to everything on earth the compass round. And only by one's going slightly taut in the capriciousness of summer air is of the slightest bondage made aware. Now, I hope you can feel that poem it has just about everything I have to say about uh, freedom. And, um, of course, the context of the poem, the, the, the one tie that went slightly taut was the marriage of the woman that, that uh, Frost had uh, fallen also in love with. And so um, in the capriciousness of summer air, she allowed herself to be friendly and available to Frost, but there was that tug of the tie that could not be entirely broken. Um, and she did not break it, but she managed to stay uh, somehow uh, faithful to her husband and somehow open to being what Frost needed her to be at that particular time. And of course, that supporting central cedar pole, which as those of you who know my work on type would call the spine of personality, that the integrity in depth. Um, some would call it the ego self axis. Some would call it uh, the less self. Certainly it's a kind of moral center that is its pinnacle to heavenward. I want to bring that pinnacle the heavenward up into foreground. And I want to bring up the idea of limitation because one of the things I've learned about integrity uh, from the I Ching and where I've written about, or at least talked about in the lecture that's never been transcribed, um, the image of integrity in the, in the uh, I Ching is an image of moral freedom, but it involves, because uh, we have the freedom to choose our action and we divine to try to find out if the action is wise. They talk about the mandate of heaven, which for, for the Chinese would be that central cedar pole that is its pinnacle to heavenward. But uh, there is a sense of sincerity, a sense of completion and a sense of limitation. Those are the three images of integrity that coming together make a cumulative image in uh, the great book of wisdom, the I Ching, which has always been a place that I've been able to go to find myself my zone of freedom in any difficult situation. And since I'm not free to ignore uh, what for me and perhaps what just simply is integrity and, and feel free, it has seemed to be a great thing to be able to make such choices. But when I look at um, Frost's image of the silken tent, I think it will give you a way to read what for me is the central image of my particular paper, which is something that only because of uh, 
Stefano, I had the opportunity to write. I've been wanting to write this paper forever, it seems to me, because um, Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, were perhaps the single most important uh, parent figures of my entire life. I actually had the joy to hear Eleanor Roosevelt speak once at the uh, private high school that I attended. And it was an extremely moving occasion. I, I went to a school that it was the preparatory school for Princeton. And my mother had a very strong idea that I would be going to Princeton University. And uh, she'd even moved to Princeton so that I would become, I think, in her mind, the next F. Scott Fitzgerald, because she had been reading him. And somehow she, I was supposed to be a writer, and I was supposed to be F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I was supposed to go to Princeton. We had absolutely no money, but I was a very smart boy, at least a very smart at passing tests well. And so I got a full scholarship to this school. And uh, But I did notice that it was an all-white school at that point. It was also an all-boys school at that point. And it had a kind of underground in which a completely African-American uh, serving community uh, that maintained the grounds and served the food and so forth lived. And uh, these were the days when the issue of segregation was now finally taken up by the Supreme Court. And so in 1954, I was a student there. I got so interested in civil rights that in, when I was doing my honors th history thesis, I wrote about um, Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement. This was in uh, in 1956, and uh, it was very interested in black history and also in uh, uh, jazz singing. So that for many years, uh, Billie Holiday, who sang the famous song "Strange Fruit," was like a goddess for me. And I actually had a chance to see her sing once when I was 20 years old. So um, that period of my life was one in which I was becoming increasingly aware of the race problem in the United States. Uh, to put it mildly. Uh, and uh, what was so moving when Eleanor Roosevelt came to the uh, Lawrenceville School at, at, to give a lecture to us, uh, we had compulsory chapel in the morning, so we had to show up, and it was roughly an uh, Anglican Episcopalian chapel, and we would have that every morning, and it, it would usually be a kind of moral or ethical lecture. It were very interesting to me, uh, and uh, and then we had to a compulsory Sunday service that we had to go to. Um, but um, when Eleanor Roosevelt spoke, it was in the evening, and the entire black staff came. It was the only time I'd ever seen them in the chapel or share in any of our lives, and except in a serving capacity. But there, there they were. That's what the Roosevelts meant to me. Now, of course, <laughs> Roosevelt could not stay, could have stayed in office if he hadn't had the support of segregationist Southern senators. So the, the ironies of politics are all through. The word irony appears shockingly often in my essay and ironies around freedom. There are many ways to look at America's freedom. You know, the, the idea of America uh, fighting a revolutionary war uh, for the right to vote was uh, rather than have things imposed on them in England was a narrative that we've all uh, accepted as Americans for the, who was taught for the longest time. Um, and so the idea of freedom is a very American idea, uh, but it only dawned on me slowly in the last 50 years that for many Americans, the word freedom simply means freedom to make money. And anything that interferes with the freedom to make money is considered wrong. So well, that could be something about the Boston Tea Party, which was fought over the uh, uh, tax on tea, which was then 
tea itself was dumped into Boston Harbor. And so we all knew that people didn't like taxation without representation. So if you're going to tax us, you have to be uh, free. We have to be free to vote. That all sounded pretty good. George III, the mad king of England, uh, was the demonized person. But as the story, as we look more closely at the story, one of the reasons George III had to be fought against to create the United States of America was that George III had, had taken a very mad position uh, indeed from a political point of view. He was against the slave trade and he wanted it put to an end. And if the slave trade was put to an end, people, many people in America would not have been able, free to make the money they needed, which they could only get if they enslaved other people to do the work that it took to make a money out of, out of an agricultural business. So the ugly truth is that one of the reasons the American Revolution was fought was to stay free to have slaves. So there is the complete irony that's in the, in the background of the concept of freedom. And so, I, as I say, I fell in love with the idea of irony when I was a college student. Uh, and finally, it just seemed that uh, <laughs> I couldn't talk about anything else. And finally, I stopped talking about it until I wrote The Trickster in the Arts, which has a lot to do with irony. But uh, the god Hermes is a very ironic god. He, uh, he often uh, crosses boundaries to, uh, to make them more secure. He's a very, very interesting god, very paradoxical god. And he is a god that uh, probably more than any other informs C.G. Jung. But Roosevelt, who I completely admire for what he did to come up with the speech that I make the subject of my entire paper, and that's the reason I wanted to write the paper, was ironically in office to make the speech about freedom because he was partly politically supported, a crucial part uh, by, by people who were busily making it hard for people of color to have the freedoms that the Civil War had supposedly, and Lincoln's, the laws passed immediately after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, allowed. So we had this enormous irony. His wife, of course, was a very, very consistently uh, political liberal who did amazing things to support uh, to support the be beginnings and the serious beginnings of not just uh, a civil rights movement, but a really empowered civil rights movement. And eventually, uh, it was a Democratic president, uh, Roosevelt's vice president, who desegregated the armed services, which in a militaristic country like America, a military defended country like America, was a gigantic step. Uh, and she had a great deal to do with that. So there was a reason why the African-American serving staff was, was, was not in service, but in attendance at her lecture. It was a way of saying thank you. Um, <clears throat> that same year, there was a, <clears throat> uh, a um, presidential primary, or around that time, there was a presidential primary uh, a year or two later in uh, the United States. And uh, in the New Jersey primary, um, it was recorded that there was one write-in vote for president of the United States for Eleanor Roosevelt, and that was my mother's vote. So I always have been rather proud of that fact. Where Roosevelt has stayed in my mind 
as a political and moral genius um, has, and what that has to do with the silken tent and that pinnacle to heaven, heavenward and why I devoted this paper to an explication of the relation of something Roosevelt said to the fact that of all our presidents, he's the only one who seems to have had a Jungian analysis. Because when he was at his most dark time of discovering that his political gifts which had already made him prominent in New York politics. He was eventually the governor of New York. Were shadowed by the fact that he suffered from polio and was paralyzed from the legs down and, and was in depression that he could never have a career at all. His wife, Eleanor, reached out to one Beatrice Hinkle, who was the first Jungian analyst in America, and asked Beatrice if she would spend some time with her husband. And her husband, Franklin, went and spent some time with Beatrice Hinkle, uh, who had been one of the pioneers of psychotherapy. But before that, in 1900, had been the first woman uh, chief medical officer in any city in America. It was the city of San Francisco. She grew up actually in California. Beatrice Hinkle happened to be the analyst of the first person I told uh, that I wanted to be a psychiatrist on my 19th birthday. She had had a Jungian analysis with Beatrice Hinkle, and so she was also the first person that I had known in Jungian analysis. So I was quite interested to learn so many years later from historian Jay Sherry, who's written some wonderful stuff about young history, that uh, Roosevelt had this uh, engagement with Beatrice Hinkle. So I think that in some way, I like to believe that um, Roosevelt found through that engagement, that kind of inner freedom, perhaps from that brief analytic encounter if it was even an analysis it, it, whatever it could have been from his point of view a medical consultation from a friend of his wife but there um he certainly knew beatrice hinkle she had arranged his first uh, uh one, of, one of his trips to uh, uh america in 1913 when he got to meet her and her friends on the uh, heterodox club, which was a very liberal club in Greenwich Village, and uh, people in that club and in the liberal club at that time tried very hard to get uh, uh, Jung a chance to meet uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the founder of the NAACP. The fact that Jung never met W.E.B. Du Bois is actually a great sadness because Jung does not write about Black people as if he understands the, the Harlem Renaissance or the degree of contribution of uh, African Americans to political liberal thinking, even though he and his wife did a lot in different ways to, to make uh, something happen there. And he, I think there he was, not, uh, he was not liberated, but he did go to the Armory show and saw the uh, first uh, showing of uh, Picasso and the Cubists and modern art in, in New York in 1913. So Jung was in some ways rather plugged in at this particular time. And it was during this time when Jung was in, in New York that he actually wrote some letters about where he was differing from, uh, from uh, Freud um, in the sense of what, um, what it would be to be um, to use analysis to create freedom. So 
I want to just read from page 33 of my paper in, in uh, it page 33 in Stefano's, um, Stefano's uh, uh, book. About the positive transference, the patient's libido fastens on the person of the analyst in the form of expectation, hope, interest, trust, friendship, and love. The transference first produces a projection of infantile fantasies, often with a predominantly erotic tinge. At this stage, it is as a rule of a decidedly sexual character, even though the sexual component remains relatively unconscious. But this emotional process serves as a bridge for the higher aspect of empathy whereby the patient becomes conscious of the inadequacy of his own attitude through recognition of the analyst's attitude, which is accepted as being adapted to life's demands and as normal. Through remembrance of the childhood relationship with the help of analysis, the patient is shown the way which leads out of the subsidiary purely sexual or power values acquired in puberty and reinforced by social prejudice. This road leads to a purely human relationship and to an intimacy based not on the existence of sexual or power factors, but on the value of personality. This is the road to freedom which the analyst should show his patient. Now, all I do in this paper is link the Jung of 1913, who couldn't read that, to the Jung I wish I had, had met, W.E.B. Du Bois, but the Jung who did analyze Beatrice Hinkle, who did do something analytic of help to Franklin Roosevelt, who did create his silk intent for democracy in the form of a speech that is now known as the Four Freedoms Speech. I consider it the single greatest piece of political uh, discourse ever, and I can compare it in its structure, his four freedoms make me immediately think of the pyramids. When I think of the pyramids, I think of something like the silken tent that isn't just silken, that sort of stays, that has a certain steadiness. The four faces come to a common point. And that common point is the pinnacle to heavenward, which is going to signify the sureness of the soul. For the Egyptians, the great, the great fulfillment of individuation took place after death. Um, for Jungians, it's, that death has been a little less concretized as when there has been a death of the commitment to ego and a willingness to accept um, the series of opposites and the complexity of opposites that is the self. It seems to me that complexity of opposites that is the self is perfectly conveyed by the pyramids. But how one gets there, or how what one guarantees, or what a Jungian analysis ought to be about, seems to me, is conveyed in the, the Four Freedoms speech. Now, everyone knew that uh, war was going come, coming in Europe. It was by now, it's giving this speech um, in early 1941. Today, it would be called a State of the Union speech. They didn't have that. They were going to have one from Biden very shortly. Uh, it now takes place in January. It used to take place in March. Uh, the This speech um, um, was not called the State of the Union speech, but it was his rallying cry. Now, remember, this is before the United States has, has actually entered the war. That's not going to happen until December. 
1941. This is very early in 1941. And, and so he has to get Congress to be willing to, to spend money to send, spend armaments to and, and support for uh, uh, the operations of Churchill defending England against, uh, against Hitler. It's very much like the problem that is, could come up if um, the House of Representatives should decide to not fund uh, support for the, uh, 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 the Ukraine. Uh, it's a very similar kind of situation. And so um, Roosevelt had to write this kind of speech and of course, speeches are crafted by speechwriters. He had a major playwright with a great poetic gift, Robert E. Sherwood, working on his team of, of, of speechwriters. And they were putting together the argument for defending freedom in Europe, even though we were not part of the war in Europe because uh, Roosevelt had had to run against Lindbergh and other different kinds of people. Lindbergh didn't become the candidate, or he didn't become the president either, except in uh, uh, Philip Roth's great novel, The Plot Against America, where it's counterfactual, but Lindbergh becomes president. But Roosevelt succeeded in going against the America firsters at that time uh, uh, by promising that he wouldn't be sending people to Europe. He wouldn't send their sons to war and so forth. It was a promise he was able to break only because the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And there will be some that would even say Roosevelt provoked that attack because he wanted to come to Hitler's age, uh, Hitler's age, Hitler's uh, the, the aid of the people fighting against Hitler. But the paradoxes of freedom always exist in political life. And I stumble in speaking just for those reasons. It's very hard to talk about the shadow without becoming participant in it. And so I'm not going to deify Roosevelt. He was a political and a pragmatic politician. But what's interesting historically is that all the speechwriters had helped him write a very workmanlike and interesting speech. He wasn't satisfied with it and so he sat down and he himself pinned the part about the four freedoms. It came from him and from no one else. I would say this is <laughs> the greatest work of art that has ever been produced by someone who had had a Jungian analysis. We can at least say that. So I just want to say what he, what he wrote. And these are his own this is his original writing. Uh, in the future days, which we seek to make secure, I remember this is early 1941, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in this world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. And the fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. So there were the four freedoms and I talk about them and some detail, but not too much detail because I want to let the image speak for itself. But I point out that one of the brilliances of what he came up with is that there are two ofs, the, the prepositions, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. 
And there are two froms. Freedom from want, want meaning deficit, poverty, hunger. Free want in the sense of what the word want in English means to have certain needs, which to which I would include these days the need to have love and to seek love in one's own way. Uh, and finally, freedom from fear. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Think of those four freedoms as the faces of the pyramid that converge on a point, and that point is what I think Stefano is calling freedom after freedom, or sometimes in a rather Hegelian way, I would say, absolute freedom. It seems to me that that speech and those pyramids point toward an archetype. Now, other places in my paper talk about other amplifying things, but I would point out that something else Jung said, and it's in his transformation symbolism of the mass, in which he's specifically talking about Christianity, and I really do not want this to be heard as in any way by me as saying that only a Christian uh, person can realize this because I've met it in every culture in a different way. So, but Jung needed to look at where that was in Christianity and where Christianity fit in. So in that essay, he has this, and then I think I'll just stop and let you re react because for the rest of the time. The Christian spirit of the West, he wrote in the transformation symbolism in the mass, has become the defender of the irrational. <laughs> a wonderful piece of Jung there, rather nifty. Since in spite of having fathered rationalism and intellectualism, it has not succumbed to them so far as to give up its belief in the rights of man, and especially the freedom of the individual. But this freedom guarantees a recognition of the irrational, I, irrational principle. This is on page 32, by the way, for our, our translator. Uh, this freedom guarantees a recognition of the irrational principle despite the lurking danger of chaotic individualism. <laughs> By appealing to the eternal rights of man, faith binds itself inalienably to a higher order, not only on account of the historical fact that Christ has proved to be an ordering factor for many hundreds of years, but also because the self effectively compensates chaotic conditions, no matter by what name it is known, for the self is the anthropos, anthropos in Latin, the root word of anthropology, which used especially in the European sense, means ultimately everything human consciousness can be. Uh, above and beyond this world. For the self is the anthropos above and beyond this world, and in him, meaning the anthropos, is contained the freedom and dignity of the individual man. Now, I think that's what I see in the pyramid coming to its point. That's what I see in the four freedoms coming to the point. The freedom and dignity of the individual. I've not forgotten that B.F. Skinner once wrote um, a book called Beyond Freedom and uh, Responsibility or something with a title very close to that. I don't think he called it Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and I didn't look it up before this, but uh, 
when I see people trying to, when I saw him trying to replace human phenomenology with behaviorism, and I see people today trying to replace human intelligence with artificial intelligence, I get the same chill as I, <laughs> as I do whenever we leave out, whenever people try to make the whole thing too rational, why I'm not a, why I use cognitive behavioral therapeutic methods when I have to, I'm finally irrational in my consciousness in sync, feeling that the thing I'm trying to keep alive as a, as, a, as a Jungian analyst, the innate freedom and dignity of the individual is an irrationally given thing that cannot be rationalized. But I think it can be approached through certain images. And I think the image of four freedoms to of and to from is about as good as political discourse gets. And I wrote, wrote this paper to claim it for Jungian psychology. Thank you, John. Thank you very, very much. Everybody's clapping. It was a beautiful lecture. It was a beautiful hour. Now you can take a breath. We can all take a breath. And uh, from this year, we will start asking questions live. So if you have a question, please raise your electronic hand. No, don't raise your hand because we are too many. We are almost 200, so I cannot see 200 hands. Just raise your electronic hand. <clears throat> you can ask the question in English. You can ask the question in Portuguese. Um, while our guest, I think of a question or two or three. John, I have a question for you. Um, it's it's a piece of theory, actually. I've been working on the concept of anima, John, are oh, you there? Yeah, right anima and animus, and you, Verena Kast, uh, Gigerich, work on the concept that the anima, as you said it yourself, is not bind to males, and animus is not bind to male. We agree on this. I have a question. What about the anima of the animus? and the animus of the anima. I'm somehow claiming that a man or a woman or whatever sex and gender can have an anima and an animus, but also this anima and animus can have an anima and an animus itself. And I give you an example. When in a dream, someone is dreaming of a, a male figure and a female figure together. So I wonder whether the second figure, which is not prominent, could be the anima of the first figure or the animus of the first figure? Absolutely, it can. In fact, that's a concept that's of some interest to me. I talked about it with Joseph Henderson almost 40 years ago, and I did say to him, you know, well, you know, we really have to put in the anima of the animus. Jung says this in the animus of the anima. And he said, well, you know, most people haven't even gotten to the anima or the animus yet. So that's a little too, you know, it's a little too much for most people to handle. So that was his answer, but I never leave anything alone that I start thinking about. And so it is in my type work. It's in my work on the, what I call the demonic and the daimonic personality. And my type model, which is an eight function, not a four function model, you have the four functions of consciousness with the anima animus, carrying in whatever proportion they are in that person, as I talked about, the three to one or the one to three or however one wants to put it. You have the anima and the animus carrying the inferior function. But you see, there's a shadow of the... Exactly. Yeah. Of the anima and animus. And that's the shadow in typology is the same function with the opposite attitude. And there you will find that there may be an anima, but the anima will have 
and animus. Now, an example of this in a fairy tale that I'm particularly fond of and have almost written about and talked about too often is in Beauty and the Beast. Now, it, that story is, I particularly like the Disney film, uh, frankly, far better than the Cocteau film, which shocks some people, but I think that, and Mar but Marina Warner, who wrote the great book on fairy tales from the Beast to the Blonde agrees with me that the Disney movie is, is an astonishing achievement. If you know that movie or your child knows that movie, the, 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 the wise woman is Angela Lansbury, her voice is the teapot and tea is served at four in the afternoon. So we can take, read that as a midlife story. Beauty represents the anima. Beast represents the animus of the anima, who is the demonic personality that becomes the daimon held with integrity, integrities in the anima or animus, held with integrity. The demon can become a daimon. And what you get there is something that people don't seem to understand from Jung. You don't get to the shadow with Jung by finding the self with the anima or the animus, and then your whole and your four functions work and you're the pyramid of Giza itself. Because every Jungian analyst who did that with that with Jung's model ended up causing so many people to dislike him or her that they split off and formed a new society of their own. All those four function people that tried to make wholeness for. But when you realize that there's going to be your integrity only entitles you to deal with the problem in your character. That's what integrity is for. We all have a character disorder. We all have a beast. But Beauty without beast has not known love. And so that he becomes the basis for the infusion of spirit. And what Jung is saying is it, it's through the shadow. Spirit enters the psyche through the shadow. So that animus of the anima is that beast in each of us that shadows the, uh, in the beauty of the beast, it's a female anima, but an animus can also have a difficult anima that could become the basis of something if that can be held with integrity. It's quite a mystery and it's something that really can't happen, I don't think, until after one is about 47 years old, but it does happen, it does happen. There is a question from Kelly. Kelly, I hope you can unmute yourself or perhaps, yeah. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you very much for this speech. I'm very glad to hear to John B. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much. And I'm very thankful for doing this question to you. I would like to ask you if, as we are talking about freedom, and you got very emotional talking about freedom. That's very important nowadays. We're seeing like a uprising of the right poli poli politics. And I would like to ask you, if we talk about the individuation process, could an individuation process be broken by a lack of freedom? The individuation process can absolutely be broken. I mean, I. Thank I'm, you very much. And I just absolutely can be broken. I want my and it can be broken by an analyst. You know, I mean, I and it doesn't have to be an analyst who uh, borrows money from you or or has sex with you or uh, exploits you by being a friend, but never the analyst. I mean, I I had a very well-meaning woman analyst that was trying very hard to help me uh, with what I would call my poor problem. And by a part of, she took aim at my Christianity because she felt that it was, she didn't like the Christianity she'd been exposed to and she didn't realize I had never been baptized and that it was something I had found for myself. And she went on the attack on it. She felt it was an inflation. And I dreamt that the Nazis had broken into the Christian into the Christian church and broken the cross. Now, Symington says that the way we define trauma, a word that is much overused now, and at times in a rather crybaby way, I have to say, uh, 
uh, and I don't mean to be insulting to the real fact of trauma, but when, to me, the definition of trauma is Neville Symington's. Trauma is that which severs the spirit. And I had that experience. And I was healed by Joseph Henderson, uh, who uh, I once had a dream in which I, and the dream said, who is Joseph of Arimathea? And uh, Joseph Henderson could never hear something without saying what he knew or what he didn't know about it. So he said, well, Joseph of Arimathea gathered Christ's blood in the chalice and took it to Glastonbury, England. And that was the grail. And I listened to the amplification and I looked at Joseph Henderson and I said, uh, it's you. And he said, well, if you feel that way, and he, and he let me have my transference to him, he healed me. He healed that broken spirit, and he allowed me to figure out what I what Christianity meant for me, which was certainly not what it means for someone who actually belongs to a church or is confirmed in it. And I found as much in Buddhism and and, uh, and I found the Judaism and I found the, you know, et cetera. I don't want to go on and on Confucianism and, and the I Ching, but the point is, um, I know what Jung is talking about, about the Christianity holding the potential for the release of freedom. And that's what I was really working on. And it, I didn't need to be, to have it destroyed as a kind of obsessive perfectionism of the good little boy who needed to discover his shadow, even though that was all true. <laughs> so that, that's my story of freedom. Being free, freedom of religion, you might say. <laughs> John, while we wait for more questions, um, I would like to contextualize your your. Oh, there is a question from Alan. Alan, go on, please. Can you? Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, hello, John. Thank you for uh, the, the the wonderful talk. And I'm here in San Francisco, and uh, very excited to see you on screen. So I so uh, I am in a way struggling with my question, but I'll do the best I can to ask it. So I follow and in the talk, the apex of the pyramid being a symbol of freedom and dignity of the individual. And the part of one of the questions that comes to mind is the relationship of your image of the pyramid to Maslow's uh, pyramid of needs, how, how the two of those symbols of the pyramid actually resonate for you. Second, I wanted to say that I appreciated your bringing African American history and culture into the discussion around freedom. And I am, my question is really related to you, this idea of the freedom of the individual and individualism and the contemporary circumstance now and the tensions between government by a libertarian or minoritarian rule versus the majority. So how to how to balance the freedoms of the individual with the collective needs, if that makes sense to you. Uh, that's right at the heart of the whole problem. And I do go on, mm -hmm. you know, I say very early in my in my paper uh, that um, in our own time, so many political ironies have resulted when an autocratically disposed political party has wrapped around its repressive policies a promise to guarantee, quote, freedom, that it seems naive to argue that the concept of freedom can be trusted to nourish more than its own abuse. So that's where that's where I start, mm -hmm. and um, and I mention Orwell, um, who of course Judge Bryant. I happen to be someone who read. Uh, someone who read 1984 when he was. 10 and uh, it was one of the great experiences of my life um, but you may remember 
freedom is slavery in the Orwell things that are on the wall and uh, that world ruled by Big Brother. And it seems to me that we have to look at that irony that that again and again, freedom has been exercised that or in the name of freedom, much repression has occurred. I mean, that's a, and, and I mean really serious repression. Right. So uh, freedom of slavery couldn't get can be more clear. So yeah, absolutely. Um, that gets us into many, many areas. Um, I think the tension between the different faces keeps the chance for and something that I would respect as the freedom and dignity of the self to emerge is somewhat protected by the opposites in those four faces. But you take even one face out and you lose you lose it. That's the best I can say. And, and uh, it's irrational. It's not something that I can, I, 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 I can't, I'm not trying to rationalize this, I, I, if mm -hmm. that makes any sense, because it can't be rationalized. The abuses, the, the abuses of Freedom. Right now, we're watching a tra you know, travesty of democracy and abuse of democracy. You know, the, right. have, when you can vote for legislatures who can nullify people's right to vote, you have the you have the you have the irony of uh, freedom. And I go into that in, as my, in fact at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're looking at an optimist or a true believer. I don't know what I am, but irrationally, there is something in me that really does believe in the ability to use freedom ethically and that there is an integrity behind the search for freedom that can be rescued because I see it in my practice all the time. But I don't, but I also see the world as it is, as you do, and it's yeah. not a pretty story. So that's all I can say. It's a true, true irony, a true paradox that I hope I can't, I'm not going to say that mine is the best solution. I'm merely saying I want to. I want to say what Ian Forster said: two cheers for democracy. That's what he called one of his books or one of his articles, and, and I really, I really like it. Yeah, thank you for the for your uh, reflections, and I'm hopeful, and I hope analytical psychology, in some ways, uh, can really help with uh, what's going on in. Uh, and really uh, the political economy uh, now, certainly here in the United States and the world. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, I mm -hmm. side your wish. I think mm -hmm. many of us here, or many on the analysis and activism list really would like that to happen, you know, for mm -hmm. us Jungian to be able to be part of this course that is out from the mm -hmm. consulting room. And I think Mr. Peter Dunlop is also yeah, Peter. Is also in favor of that. Peter, uh, Mike, uh, uh, mute yourself. Thank you, Stefano. Hi, John. Um, when you were speaking of um, Roosevelt being in therapy with a Jungian analyst, I um, it was so activating for me. Just, it, I just felt such a tenderness in that moment, and and maybe hopes the word too. And when I imagine what Roosevelt was capable of, I just, I so despair for our time, and and I look for some, some, um, I look, I pray, I wish for some improvement, and I just wonder about the way a human a human being is a product of their time and. And is there some corollary between Roosevelt and his time and what he did and Obama and our time and what Obama either succeeded at or at least attempted? Yeah, well, of course I adore but Obama, but oddly enough, I think Biden is the more, in, is, the, is in some ways, if it's as if, It's as if the Obamas are almost um, Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, and Biden is almost, is almost Franklin Roosevelt, 
and then that's the other way. Eleanor Roosevelt was a wonderful presence. She was not a wonderful speaker. Um, uh, and it's apparent, Obama's a wonderful speaker, Biden is a terrible speaker. Uh, I mean, he has an actual handicap in a variety of ways, but, uh, and, and so it's not, there's, but you know, he really does know how to deliver. I mean, he's done so much more for child poverty in America than, than Obama ever did. I mean, he, child poverty has been the greatest sin is the neglect of education and child poverty in America. It's appalling. And it's dropped dramatically under uh, Biden's uh, administration. That would be an example of the freedom from want. And, and of course, that's very close to the freedom from fear because in a country as economically and materialistically uh, oriented as America, to be poor is to be afraid. I mean, I, I came from a very poor family, and so I do know about that. Thank you. John, thank you very much. We are at the end of this first Psychosocial Wednesday. I would like to thank you immensely for tonight, for our friendship, and we look forward to more from you. Um, thank you for letting me um, <laughs> have, a, have a true breakthrough because I think without you, Stefano, this paper would never have been written. And it's such a joy to talk about it with people who care about it. All thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. We will see you in a month with Marianne Notte Meister. Title is Key to the Self. We will look at individuation through the larger lenses of um, the stars. So be with us. Bernard von Guretzky will be the moderator. And I wish you good night if you are in Europe. Good afternoon if you are in North, South America or somewhere else in the world. Thank you for coming. We were almost 200, 196. This is amazing. Thank you, Thank Lucia. you, John. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.